So let's talk about the process of drawing your pistol or sidearm from the outside the waistband holster such as I have on right now. All right, uh, if you get good with this four step process, which sounds kind of mechanical, um, but if you get good with it, you'll be able to refine and, and smooth off some of the, the edges and be overall better at your draw, especially in that self-defense situation. Let's talk about it. So we were taught four steps in the military, uh, achieving the grip while you break the retention on the holster, clearing the holster, uh, marrying your grip up towards the center of your chest or your sternum, and then pressing out uh, straight, uh, picking up the sights as you press the gun out to full extension or position four for our purposes. So uh, if you get good at this four step draw, it also uh, lends itself to helping you with your concealed draw because the way I'll teach your hand or your support hand will be busy every time um, and it's moving while your primary hand's moving so it's easy to make that into a removing or pulling away of the garment or any obstacles in your way if you're if you're drunk or from something inside the waistband so let's talk about it so step one step one uh, there's a couple parts both hands are moving at the same time so you can before you get this other hand involved this support hand you can see where your step one is. You need to be good at breaking your retention. Right here, I have a level three retention Safari Land holster. It has a bell, it has the ALS, and it has friction. So I come straight down on it, break that retention, and get a, a very high and tight grip, high into the tang uh, of the back strap, right? Um, trying to be fast and shoot before you get step one down always caused me to have the gun out and I might get one good shot but any follow-up shots I had to it was either all over the place because I couldn't control the recoil of the gun because the top of the gun was flailing uh, I didn't have a good high and tight grip uh, or I had before I took a second shot I had to readjust my grip and then continue to shoot so step one just feel where that good spot is make sure you're, you can break your your retention Pretty well you can break down that whole process just a step one and just practice that if I'm doing a, a drill where I'm coming up to be timed and trying to beat someone else competition wise or whatever the case may be I'll practice everything I can practice before I get up there right I practice the things that I can practice which is step one usually of my draw so that's what our primary hands doing our secondary hand, our support hand, is also doing something. If we had a rifle and we transitioned, we'd be putting that rifle down and then we'd be bringing that support hand right up here to our chest, waiting to receive um, the pistol from our primary hand once we get to step three, which I'll show you. So in the meantime, when I go to step one, I bring that hand up and I lock it right into my chest. A couple reasons you do that. For one, efficiency, of course. Efficiency makes you quick. All right um, but also I want to prevent myself from flagging my own hand muzzling my own hand in case I get into a situation where I'm going here and I'm trying to go too fast right and I don't have a good system built in place I need to be here waiting on that gun right not out here waiting on the gun so that's why we bring this hand up here so both hands are always moving at the same time wherever you start from that high thoracic up in the bullwinkle position or hands in front of you or whatever you're going to do your hands need to do the same thing every time both move both move so let's get a couple of practice runs with step one here high and tight broke my retention here high and tight broke my retention i got a habit of pulling it up a little bit but i really don't need to do that for step one here high and tight break my retention all right so that's step one step two pretty easy all we got to do is clear the holster but for my purposes I like to go ahead and include a 
high thumb pectoral index when I come to step two because I have people stop in this position a lot of times and I explain why it's good to know that position right away. Um, yes, if I'm drawing quickly, my step two won't be so rigid up here, high pectoral like this. But if I know how to do it or something stimulates me to do that versus extending, right? Someone coming towards me in a clo close uh, quarters environment, then I know it's there, right? And I can smooth that out as I go because I know uh, at any one point my mind decides what's going on in front of me and if I'm going to draw or not. I will determine whether I can go full extension, stay in close, whatever I need to do from there. And if I know I'm going to full extension based off of the circumstances, I'll kind of bypass coming to that high thumb pectoral index position, right? But it's good to start there and, and get a, a good rigid feel of high thumb pectoral index, which will help you in retention shooting in close later on. So here's what it looks like. Here, hand comes, break that retention, get that high and tight grip bring it up and here I am, right? Notice my elbow's high, my thumb is flagged, so it, it's between my slide and my pec, right? Hence the name high pectoral, high thumb pectoral index. And it's pointed uh, generally at a 45 degree angle towards where a person's hips might be or his lower body, uh, somewhere in that area, right? This hand's still here, right? That would be the next step, step three. So I'm right here. Get a couple of them so you can see it. So one, two, there's two. One, two, right there. Glued into my side, glued into my rib cage. So if I had to turn my hips, uh, that would do the aiming for me, not my wrist. That's a deeper subject though. So here we go, one, two, let's move on to step three. So step three is essentially where my hands marry together on that pistol. My support hand comes in, gives me the support required, right? When my hands marry up, I like to have my hand or my gun parallel with the ground already. So I could potentially start shooting from here all the way out, right? I could be shooting from here all the way out. So let's go through the steps and I'll show you position three. One, two, three. Right here, as I know I'm going to shoot, I've made a decision to shoot, I will start prepping my trigger by pulling the slack out. All right? So, and I can shoot all the way out. So I'll make my grip right there. So position three, marrying the grip. For me, as it's compressed towards my body, I don't like to make my grip right away here close to my body. I kind of leave it open and I scissor my hands into that position, right? Talked about that on a prior video, scissoring the hands. So one, two, three. I use that flag thumb that I have from my high pectoral index as a touch point for my other hand and also the bottom of my trigger guard. Touch, touch. That's my position three, married up. Now I extend and go to the trigger once I know I'm gonna shoot. So let's look at position four. Position four is simply full extension all the way out, right? I wanna pick up my sights as soon as possible. So I don't want to fish this, fishing, and I don't want to bowl, all right? So I'm here bringing it up under and up, call that bowling. A lot of people do that, right? So, because it feels kind of mechanical, they feel like it's faster from point A to point B or holster to full extension to get that gun right up there immediately. What they're missing is their chance to see that sight as it goes out, pick up the sight earlier rather than later. And a lot of times I find myself not having to even shoot, wait till I get the full extension to press the trigger through because I have a sight picture somewhere about here before I'll, I get to full extension. And that's my aim a lot of times, uh, or my goal. So that being said, let's talk about how you can be faster. So 
I have had guys talk, uh, shown me certain techniques that make you fast, just they're talking about here, and bringing the gun up. So as soon as I get to position two, as I'm teaching it, one, two, skipping up here to your chest and bringing it straight up under your eye right here, which I do think is a little faster, a little more efficient, right? The reason I don't uh, utilize that technique is because I've got years of training that I don't want to change. And if I competed enough where I thought I was had to win by milliseconds, or if I had some kind of goal like achieving some uh, title, uh, and it was based off of time, and that's I couldn't find any other way to beat time, then I guess I would start shaving certain things off here and there for tenths of a second. But it's just too much programming inside of me now that I really don't want to change. So I don't subscribe to coming through holster or position two all the way up under the eye quickly. I think it is good. I think if you're good at that already, keep it. Um, mine plays more towards the self-defense situation where I'm here and I can stay here if I needed to and I can extend if I needed to. I can shoot back here. So you have the option of going between both and I just don't want to reprogram my draw. Nothing wrong with it. I think it's, if it's good for you, it's good. So let's look at the difference real quick. I'll we can slow it down on the video. Here's what I've seen people teach, which seems to be pretty fast. Right? Boom. Up under my eye. So do what, do what you feel good about, man. I like to start here, and it look, even though it looks so mechanical, it does get smoothed out over time between step one, two, three, and four. So try it out. Let's talk about point shooting. Um, people ask, I guess there's a, people are curious about point shooting. I think that in a scary situation, you may point shoot um, and, and look at what the threat is versus looking at your sights. Even though you may have trained a billion times and you've got a good system in place, it's, it's kind of hard to, if you haven't practiced seeing something close to you very scary very often, which is hard to simulate in training, right? Uh, it's hard not to look at that thing. Your, your instincts are going to say, look at that. Tunnel vision, it's going to look big in your face, right? Uh, but what helps you be good at point shooting should you have to point shoot, whether it be competition or whatever and there's levels to this shit of course but what helps me be able to point shoot pr fairly easily at certain close range distances is that I've practiced a thousand times or more seeing that sight from here to here so if I didn't have sights or if I was scared I'd bring that gun up and it'd be fairly close to the same spot every time because I've seen that sights there see I'm looking at you at the camera I draw I'm not looking at the sights, but then I look back and I, my gun is fairly flat. I can see my front sight post fairly well, and I'm sure I could hit a, uh, a silhouette size target pretty easily from myself out to maybe 10 yards or so. Um, so using your sights well, aligning them as you train your draw, every time seeing those sights is what helps you be good at point shooting should you have to point shoot. So there is a place for it, but you don't get the cart before the horse. See those sights every time. It comes time to not see the sights, your gun, your body's been recording that process of you putting that gun right here so it knows where to put it, all right? So try that out. And also, I'm, if you told me I'm doing a one-shot drill from the draw on the, the shot timer, right? And you tell me the shooter ready, stand by, and whatever position I start from, beep, right? I already know I'm shooting, right? I already know that as soon as my gun is pointed towards the target and I've got enough practice where I know I'm safe here and my gun's not pointing this way, this way, that way, or this way when I come up to my, between position two and position three, then I am safe enough to put, put my, uh, I am safe enough to put my finger on that trigger and start pressing slack. I have as I've worked guns, different guns and, and work, practice I have popped a shot off here before unintentionally um, negligent no accidental yes but in a safe direction and it was me allowing for that in my training because I knew that I was trying to get used to a trigger and I was trying to get that slack or get to the wall as soon as possible 
with the gun that I was using, right? So, uh, so it locks where my, tr my trigger finger goes to the trigger. Fairly fast. If I had to be at position two, then I would go here. But usually I, I marry my hands up, and as I start pressing out, my finger is on the trigger. Right here, you tell me now, now, I reset. Reset. So, my finger goes on the trigger as soon as my gun is aligned up with the threat for me when I know that I am shooting. I've already made the decision to shoot. Have I put my finger on the trigger before and then decided not to shoot? Yeah, I have. And luckily I had enough training to where I didn't slap that thing. I started prepping and then I released. I made a different decision, All right? Uh, talk about this in some of my rifle classes. I've flipped my safety to semi before uh, in houses and that was a process of beginning to address the threat. But as I did that, I made a different choice based off the millisecond information that I received after I did that, right? So I went to safe, or excuse me, back to the semi and went back to safe. So you have that time, oh, no, all right? So the only time I would quick draw in a self-defense situation is you already know you're gonna shoot, right? Um, not speaking about strategy or, or or tactics concerning drawing on a drawn gun or anything like that. But if I'm drawing, I know I don't have a gun in my hand and I'm about to draw. I already get I have to make that decision to shoot. Most of the times, if I drew my gun, which uh, like a cop scenario where they have gray areas, like you might have to pull that gun thinking one thing, keeping that finger off the trigger, stay compressed, not go full extension, be ready for something. But not be on the trigger even though you might be here right uh, maybe you're using that to negotiate some uh, de-escalate potentially which that sounds counterintuitive I guess to have your gun out trying to de-escalate but uh, when some people realize that they're in a fight where and they realize the, well, what's at stake sometimes that de-escalates them so it's like a forceful de-escalation um, um, and think about this too from concealed if I was going to conceal, everything would be the same. I'd have one, set my two from the appendix would be two clearing the holster, three, four, and that support hand would simply be, instead of working to move to the spot and wait, it would be moving here and then waiting, or moving here, then waiting, right? So it applies with inside the waistband concealed carry as well. Um, still break it down into four steps um, if you like, and still get the Rule of thumb is get the barrel pointed in the direction of the threat or the downrange direction as soon as possible is my rule of thumb. As soon as possible, so here, right here, here, here. Once I got it out of the holster, I never wanted to go any direction besides what I'm intending to point that gun out, gun at. So no direct other direction besides what I'm intending to point that gun at. So here, it's already turning that direction. And as soon as I can, I get that thing parallel to the ground, out to position four. That's position four. Uh, one thing to add with position four. Got one, two, three. It's hard for me to slow it down. Let's do it over. One, two, three, four. So what I see a lot of times is guys, as they're practicing their draw, they rush out here, and then they're sitting out here for a long time. Right, so they basically get the position for full extension, and then they're trying to find their sights, which is good. I'm glad they're trying to find their sights, and they're trying to be accurate, not just throw rounds. But the way you can prepare yourself or get better at refining uh, shooting as you come to full extension versus going to full extension and then trying to shoot, right? There's a difference. Is by going slower from position three to position four, and trying to see the sights as you get out to position four. And uh, one way to help with that is use the one quarter, three quarter rule or slide into second base uh, rule. Meaning I do everything fast, go fast where I can, then go slow where I have to. Right there at the end, I slide into second base. That last quarter of my whole process is slowed down. I'm seeing the sights and I press. Right, so here, this. So instead of doing this, oh, 
Whoa, well, where's she at? Where is she? There she is. There she is. I go here and I kind of slow it down as I practice between position three and position four. Boom. All right, I hope that makes sense. I'm trying to get better with this level three retention holster. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Plus, I see guys that I still teach, police officers and whatnot, that still have this bell, this back strap on there. So, I've been trying to use that. And, and I like the idea of having something to cover this thing up in a fight. And if I thought I would have to go to it, Potentially, then I can always put that bell down and I still have some other retention there and make it fast. So say if I went and you wore this this particular holster for competition, I don't think it's a bad habit necessarily that you're instilling yourself if you run this down. It's just approaching things from a tactical, strategic standpoint to make yourself better. So if I come up to you and I see that your hands are in your pockets and somebody said there was somebody with a weapon out here, maybe I put this bell down and I'm ready here, get your hand on the gun, right? So I don't see anything wrong with that. I know people say train as you fight. Well, I might fight like this, and I might fight light it up. So I try to get good at both of them. Boom. So it's up to you to figure that out. Last thing, um, remember, as I holster, I practice doing everything in reverse. So there's no hurry to holster necessarily, right? Some people would need to be able to not have to look it into their holster like a police officer because the situation might change as I'm putting my gun away and some of these uh, freaky situations that cops find themselves in. But if you're new to this stuff, don't be in a hurry to holster. Do not be in a hurry to holster. See it in there, right? Don't do anything unsafe. Keep your garments out of the way, right? That's a good thing about outside of the waistband, the offset here, got space, right? So nothing gets tangled in there. It's, it's free to, to, to grab and put away. Um, so don't be in a rush to reholster, right? Find yourself, you find yourself dry firing and stuff like that, and everybody just holstering. Stop that. Don't don't be in a rush, right? So I come back in, and I go back the same way, just everything in reverse, parallel to the ground. Come back almost to that high uh, thumb pectoral index, right? I find the holster, I come to the back of it and sit it in, right there, right? Or I can put it straight in however you uh, want to skin that skin that cat. So back, everything in reverse. Look, my support hand goes back here. Um, might have to move my garment. Might have to adjust something here, pull something out of the way. Right? Might be holding a door. Whatever. Back into the holster. And uh, put the retention back in place if you need to. That's the four-step draw process. That's what I was taught. That's what I continue to use. I feel like you can refine it, smooth the edges, and everything will be pretty, pretty fast.